I love this time of year. I love the, uh, the temperature. I love the colors. I love the elections. The other morning I saw a, uh, a flock of geese heading south. I, I love to, to listen to them honking and watch them fly in formation overhead. A uh, friend of mine, farmer back, back home in Fayette County, he was telling me that, you, you know, Mr. Clay, that, uh, that goose that's out in front of that formation, he's, uh, he's the leader. He provides, uh, he sets the pace and he provides direction, he said. But you know, when you, when you hear those geese honking, that's not, the, uh, that's not the lead goose. That's not the leader. He said, no, the, uh, that goose that's flying out front and in front of all of the other geese, he, he sets the pace and he provides direction. It's all the rest of the, uh, the geese behind him that are, that are honking at him. And what they're doing is they're, they're honking encouragement to him. Keep going, they're saying. Keep going. Keep going. Until finally when he gets too tired, another goose comes up and provides leadership. You know, I think, uh, I think we can learn a lot from nature. about leadership. So the next time you find yourselves out front and you hear a lot of honking behind you, just think to yourself, they want me to provide leadership and set the pace. It's hard for a, a politician like me to, uh, to keep his mouth shut as a leader. I've certainly uh, I've certainly gotten myself in trouble with my mouth over the years. And since I've, uh, I've been retired, I've had some time now to, to contemplate the big question, why Henry Clay was never elected president. Three times I ran for president, three times defeated, twice denied denomination. Why was Henry Clay never elected president? Well, personality, perhaps. Personality. I, uh, I don't get along with uh, some people like Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, a few others, John Randolph. Opposition. Perhaps the reason I was never elected president was because of who I was running against. Some tough old coots. Personality, opposition, issues. That might be it. Issues. You know, of course, that, uh, that I was always against slavery. And being against slavery cost me a lot of votes in the South. Personality, opposition, issues, perhaps, or maybe, just maybe, it was luck. If you've... Uh, if you have read anything about me, you will probably have heard the stories about Henry Clay. Henry Clay, they say, Henry Clay is a gambler. Henry Clay is a duelist. Henry Clay loves the company of beautiful women. Henry Clay uh, enjoys a drink now and then. Perhaps you have heard those rumors. <laughs> well, they're true. <laughs> But uh, gambling. Now, as a young man, I was, uh, I was something of a gambler. I loved to play cards. And uh, my favorite card game? My favorite card game was a, was a game called Brag. I don't, you don't play Brag anymore. But you, uh, you have a game, I understand, that's a lot like Brag. You call it, you call it poker. Now, in, uh, in playing Brag, what you try to do is you, is you try to out-brag your opponent. Um, bluff them. Out-bluff them. Now, you try to out-brag your opponent into thinking that your hand is better than theirs, and they give up, they quit, and you win. And so the way to, to win at brag is you, uh, you hold your, your cards close to your chest. And you, and you try not to make any kind of a facial expression that will tell your opponent if you've got a good hand or a bad hand. You want them thinking. You want them thinking. Now, the way to, to get them thinking 
is every time it comes your turn, you raise the stakes. Every time it goes around, raise the stakes higher. Pretty soon your, your opponent starts thinking to himself, that Henry Clay, he's making this a big game. His hand must be better than mine. They fold, you win. Now the problem in playing brag is, if your opponent starts thinking that Henry Clay, that, that, that no good, that so-and-so, that Henry Clay, he is just playing brag. He, is, he, is bla he, is, he doesn't really have a good hand. And they call your brag. So the uh, problem with playing brag is you can either win big or you can lose big. And uh, in my lifetime, I have won big and I have lost big. I have uh, I've always thought that politics and gambling had a lot in common. The results are uncertain, the odds are great, but playing the game is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Politics. Thomas Jefferson once said that uh, politics is such a torment that I would advise every man I love not to mix in it. Wise man, Jefferson. When Jefferson was once told that, that uh, Andrew Jackson was going to run for president, he said, I am much afeard of Andrew Jackson becoming president. He is the most unfit man I know of for such a place. Wise man, Jefferson. Stupid man, Andrew Jackson. <laughs> did, you, did you hear that when Andrew Jackson was on his deathbed, the old military tyrant finally kicking off, they invited all of his friends in to say goodbye, both of them. <laughs> One of them walked up to his bedside and he said, Old Hickory, Old Hickory, Old Hickory, is there anything you feel like you've left undone with your life? The old military tyrant, uh, uh, Yes, yes. I only regret that I didn't hang John C. Calhoun and shoot Henry Clay. <coughs> shoot Henry Clay? Why would anyone want to shoot Henry Clay? The great compromiser, they called me. The great negotiator, they called me. Prince Hal, Harry of the West. I had friends everywhere. Why would anyone want to shoot Henry Clay? Although a couple of people did try. First time is in 1809, I was serving in the Kentucky legislature. And uh, the British, huh, back in those days, the British, they were stirring up the Indians out here on the frontier and, and the Indians were attacking our settlements. The British Navy, they were stopping our ships on the high seas and they were kidnapping our sailors. To support our administration, I offered as a resolution in the house and I thought that we should wear homespun Kentucky clothing instead of imported British clothing. That pompous Federalist. Humphrey Marshall disagreed with our administration. He disagreed with my idea. Next thing I knew, he and I exchanged words and I went after him with both fists. This big German American, General Riffle, he had his, he had his desk there right between us. And he, he caught us both back. Up. Come, boys, no fighting here, or I vips you both. Well, I'm six foot. Humphrey Marshall is six foot three and weighs about 300 pounds. But I do believe that that German could have vipped us both. And so I apologized. Humphrey Marshall. <laughs> Humphrey Marshall jumped up and he said, it's the apology of a liar and a coward. Well, I don't know what it's like in your time, but back in my day, when someone insulted your honor, there was only one thing to do, and that was to challenge him to a duel. And unfortunately, Humphrey Marshall accepted. We agreed to fight the duel in Indiana. 
so as not to shed our blood on dear Kentucky soil. <laughs> we agreed. Three fires at ten paces. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ready. Aim. Fire. Humphrey Marshall fired first. Missed. I fired. And I grazed him. Just above the navel. Damn. Second fire. Ten paces. Ready. Aim. Fire. Humphrey Marshall fired first. Missed again. I fired. My pistol snapped. It didn't go off. But in the rules, that counted as my fire. Damn. Third fire. Ready. Aim. Fire. Humphrey Marshall fired first. He shot me. He shot me. And that affected my aim. And I missed him again. That's not true. I probably would have missed him the third time as well. But I wanted to fire again. But the seconds said no. They called an end to the proceedings. And they, uh, they took me over to Louisville to recover from that wound. That was about the time I started collecting walking sticks. If you ever come visit my home, Ashland, near Lexington, come around and tell Lucretia that I, I said it was okay for you to come in and, and see my collection. I should have used a rifle. <laughs> I, really, I should have. Not a bad shot with a rifle. One day I was, uh, I was giving a campaign speech near Lexington. And as I was speaking to the crowd, I happened to notice standing off to the side was this big mountain man. Buckskin, beard, coonskin cap. And he, he cradled his rifle in his arm like this. He, look, he looked up at me and said, young man! Young man, you, you say you want to go to the state legislature. Can you shoot straight? Well, I thought he was speaking rhetorically. So I knew that when it came to Kentucky politics, sometimes you had to brag a little bit. And so I figured I'd, I'd better brag if I was going to get these votes. And so I said, Sir, Henry Clay is the best shot in the country. Now that's more than a little brag. That's a big brag. Hmm. Well, he said, uh, Well, then you shall go to the state legislature, but first we must see you shoot. First we must see a specimen of your skill. Put up your target, sir. So they did. They put up a target about 80 yards off. 80 yards. So I said, does that rifle of yours shoot straight, sir? He said, old Bess has never missed. We shall soon see about that. <laughs> I thought to myself. So I took old Bess and I took aim at that target. It was about, it was 80 yards off. So I aimed and I pulled the trigger, and I hit it. <laughs> I didn't just hit it. I hit it smack dab in the middle. And no one was more surprised than I was. <laughs> I have never fired a rifle before or since. And I hit it right smack dab in the middle of that target, 80 yards off. People said, that was a lucky shot. That was a lucky shot. He'll never be able to do that again. He'll never do that again. Make him shoot again. Make him shoot again. I said, I, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I will shoot again. If anyone can beat that shot. <laughs> I knew no one could beat it. I hit it smack dab in the middle. No one could try to beat that shot. Sometimes when you play brag, you win. Sometimes you lose. <laughs> now, if I had that rifle when I fought my second duel in 1826, well, your history books might be a bit different. <laughs> By 1826, of course, a lot of things had changed in my life. I married Lucretia Hart. We had 11 children. Of course, I served a couple of short terms in the Senate was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives on my first day in office. They said that, they thought that, 
they elected me Speaker of the House because they thought I could control John Randolph. Do you all know John Randolph? You can't control John Randolph. He would do the craziest things. That man hated me with his heart and soul. One day I was, I was walking along this, this narrow little path just outside of Washington, just wide enough for one person to pass. And as I walked along, I happened to look up and here comes John Randolph. Now he and I hadn't spoken for a, a long time. He and I disagreed on almost everything. Well, when he saw me, he stopped and I stopped. Now you have to know John Randolph. John Randolph was a large man, but he had this high, squeaky, feminine voice. It was very irritating. When he saw me, he, he kind of drew himself up and goes, Well, Mr. Clay, I never sidestep for skunks. Well, I immediately jumped off the path and said, I always do. <laughs> <laughs> John Randolph didn't talk to me for a long time after that. <laughs> a lot of things had changed in my life by that duel in 1826, but probably what most folks remember about me is the election of 1824. Oh, John Quincy Adams was running, Andrew Jackson, Crawford of Georgia, and myself. None of us received a clear majority, so the election was to be decided in the House of Representatives, where as speaker, some, some of my friends thought I had some influence. Because you see, only the top three vote-getters were going to be, uh, be decided upon in the House. I came in fourth, so I was eliminated. And so, uh, I decided that I should visit each of the candidates, John Quincy Adams and Crawford and Jackson, I met with Crawford, he was too sick. He would not be able to, uh, to sit in the president's chair. And so in my mind, that left Jackson and Adams. Adams, have you seen any pictures of John Quincy Adams? He always looks so, so dour, doesn't he? He always looks so glum. Not fun at parties, not fun. That man hated me with his heart and soul. And I'm not sure, he heard all of these terrible things about me. Terrible things. To John Quincy Adams, I was something of a, of a hedonist. Henry Clay, he said. Henry Clay, Henry Clay, he's a duelist. Henry Clay is a drinker and a gambler. Henry Clay enjoys the company of beautiful women. To him, I was a hedonist. Worse, I was a southern hedonist. Worse yet, I was a Western Southern hedonist. But he was from the Northeast, not a particularly patriotic part of the country. And of course, I was a war hawk for the War of 1812, and he didn't want to go to war with the British for any reason. And he was very upset when I was chosen to be one of the, uh, the peace negotiators, to go to Ghent to, to negotiate with the British. He was so upset that he would, not even, uh, he would not even sit down at the dinner table with the rest of us. He said we smoked smelly cigars and we drank cheap wine. Ladies and gentlemen, the wine was not cheap. <laughs> the, smell, the cigars were pretty smelly. <laughs> and it is true that my card games would be breaking up about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, just about the time John Quincy Adams would be waking up to start his day. <laughs> but I think... Adams and I learned something from each other. Because when I, uh, when I sat down at the negotiating table and I sat across from the British negotiators, I looked him in the eye and I saw Bragg. They were trying to out-brag us. They were trying to out-bluff us. And I knew that a western southern hedonist from Kentucky could certainly outbrag any Britisher. And I think we did all right. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. What has that man done except win a military victory? Why do the people of this country think that just because a man is a military hero that he is a statesman? That man hated me with his heart and soul. And I don't, well, I know why. I gave a speech in 1819. And he was offended by my speech. Offended. Offended. 
have to remember the time. The uh, Indians were coming across the, the coming across from the Spanish territory of Florida, coming across the border into Georgia, and they were attacking our settlements. The president sent Andrew Jackson and his men down to Georgia to protect our settlers. And so what did Andrew Jackson do? He invaded Florida without authorization, without permission. He invaded a foreign territory. But that's not all. He captured two British citizens and had them put to death for aiding the enemy, aiding the Indians. Ladies and gentlemen, these two British citizens were nothing more than shopkeepers. That's how they were aiding the enemy. But that's not all. He had one of his ships drop anchor just offshore, and he had him lower our flag, and in its place, put up a British flag on his ship. And then they invited two Indian chiefs on board his British ship to negotiate how the British might help those two Indian tribes in their fight against us. And what did Andrew Jackson do? He hanged those two Indian chiefs. He hanged them in retribution, he said. Retribution, ladies and gentlemen. France has Napoleon, England has Cromwell, but we have Andrew Jackson. I mean, of course, no disrespect against the old military tyrant. <laughs> but how could I support such a man for president? I could not. I threw my support to Adams. Several others followed suit, and Adams won on the first ballot. He would be our next president. And he asked me to serve as his Secretary of State. I accepted. Jackson and his supporters said, a deal, a bargain, a corrupt bargain, they said, was struck between myself and Adams. They claimed that because I threw my support Adams only because I knew in advance that Adams would offer me Secretary of State, which was then a stepping stone to the presidency. There was no deal. There was no bargain. But no attack on my, my honor was as bad as the attack by John Randolph. He accused me of a corrupt bargain. He attacked me personally, and I had no choice but to challenge him to a duel. I really didn't think he'd accept, but he did. The night before the duel, my, uh, my wife Lucretia's cousin, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, came over to our house to try to talk me out of the duel. The scene at my house must have touched his heart. My wife Lucretia was still dressed all in black, still in mourning. Two of our daughters lost, were lost to us that summer before. My, uh, my little three-year-old, John Morrison, was asleep on the sofa. Well, Thomas Hart Benton then uh, left my house, and, and he went to John Randolph's house and told him about what he had seen. Supposedly, John Randolph said, I'll do nothing to disturb the sleeping child or the repose of the mother. <laughs> Randolph. Randolph. You know, I believe that one of the reasons why I was elected to be the Speaker of the House that first day was because of John Randolph. One of the things that he used to do is he used to bring his hunting dogs right into the chamber with him and have his hunting dogs sit at his feet by his desk. First thing I did when I was Speaker of the House is I had the Sergeant of Arms remove those hunting dogs. In hindsight, I should have kept the dogs and just removed John Randolph. The next morning, we agreed to the duel. Three fires. We met across the Potomac in Virginia. Ready. Aim. Fire. I fired first. Missed. John Randolph raised his pistol. He fired. Missed. Hit a tree stump behind us. 
Thomas Hart Benton ran forward trying to call the proceedings to a halt. <laughs> I said, Thomas, this is child's play. That was a big brag. <laughs> Second fire, 10 paces. Ready, aim, fire. I fired first, missed again. I should have brought a rifle. And then John Randolph did the strangest thing. He raised his pistol up, but he fired straight in the air. And he said, I do not fire at you, Mr. Clay. And he came forward with his hand extended. I met him halfway and we shook hands. And he said, you owe me a coat, Mr. Clay. I said, I owe you a coat, sir. It seems that my first shot, I just missed his hip, but I got his coat. So I bought him a new coat. <laughs> I understand that John Randolph has left instructions that when he dies, he wishes to be buried facing west instead of east because in his words, I want to keep an eye on Henry Clay. <laughs> But whenever I, uh, I lost, whether it was a duel or an election or my health began to go bad, I could always go home. Home. When I was little, my home was in Virginia, Hanover County, Virginia. My father died when I was four years old. I don't remember my father. But I do remember, 1781, when Colonel Tarleton and his British troops came and they attacked our home. My father had died just a couple of days before the uh, Colonel Tarleton's troops attacked. And I do remember, I do remember the British troops taking their swords and, and poking their swords into my father's fresh grave. I remember my mother screaming at them to stop. They said they were looking for buried treasure. I remember back inside the house, Colonel Tarleton himself came in. He took a stack of coins and he put the stack of coins on the dining room table to pay for the damage done by his troops, he said. I can remember hanging on to my mother as she walked over and then she, she picked up that handful of coins and she threw them into the fireplace. From my mother, I learned the meaning of independence and freedom. Later on, when I was a little boy, I came across a runaway slave. I asked him why he was running away from home. He told me about what life was like as a slave. I took pity on him. I knew it was against the law and I knew it was wrong. But I went home and I got food and I brought food back to him to help him escape. Later, I found out that that slave was killed while resisting arrest. He would rather be dead than be a slave. That stayed with me all my life. I always knew slavery was wrong and slavery was evil. No country can truly call itself great when it enslaves others. But if my opposition to slavery was the reason why I was never elected president, I'd rather be right than president. But when defeated, home. And home for me and here in Kentucky is my farm Ashland near Lexington, about 600 acres. local man was asked by a stranger once, 
Who's the best farmer in Fayette County? The man thought for a minute and he said, well, the, the second best farmer in Fayette County is Henry Clay. The man said, Henry Clay is the second best farmer in Fayette County. Who is the best farmer in Fayette County? He said, Mrs. Clay. <laughs> and that is absolutely the truth. Whenever I would have to go off to Washington or out campaigning or whatever, I would, I would give Lucretia a check. And I'd say, now, now this is to be used for the running of the house and running of the farm. I'd come back weeks or months later, she would hand me back that same check. Say, I had no need of this. Lucretia, my wife, my friend, she suffered almost as much as I did because of the family. I had 11 children. All six of my girls would die young. And my boys, one boy will spend his entire life in an insane asylum. One boy was thrown in jail for non-payment of debt. One boy's got a problem with alcohol. And my favorite son, Henry Jr., was killed at the Battle of Buena Vista in a war with Mexico. Home. Home was a place where I could come back to my friends and family, back to Kentucky, back to home. But I almost lost home. <laughs> Y'all are probably too young to know this yet, but sometimes when you, uh, when you loan money to family, you don't get that money back. That's a truth that you should remember. <laughs> So I, uh, I had loaned money to some, uh, some family and friends and I didn't get the money back. I had to borrow heavily against my farm, Ashland. The, the note was staggering. One day I went to the Northern Kentucky Bank to pay on that note. The clerk said, there is no note. I said, what do you mean there's, there's no note? I, I need to pay on my note. He said, the, the note's been paid, sir. I said, paid by whom? I, I owe thousands and thousands of dollars. Who could pay for such a thing? He said, your friends, sir. Your friends wanted to thank you for your many years of service to your country, sir. I've often been accused of being an emotional man, and the tears streamed down my face. But all I could say was, did any man ever have such friends? Home. Home. I, uh, my critics, my critics say Henry Clay, Henry K Clay is a gambler. If I was standing in front of a jury, I would have to plead guilty. They say Henry Clay is a duelist. Guilty. Henry Clay enjoys a drink now and then. More often than then. Guilty. Henry Clay enjoys the company of beautiful women. Ladies of the jury. Guilty. They say Henry Clay loves his country more than he loves life itself. Guilty. They say I, uh, I was dealt a bad hand. Three times defeated for president. The loss of my children and my health. I've developed a cough I swear is going to be the death of me yet. <laughs> but you know what? I wouldn't change any of it. Service, freedom, independence, those are things worth fighting for. 
I do not know how you will uh, judge me. I don't know if you will remember me at all. But, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I think it's probably about that time that this old country lawyer rest his case. So I thank you for the invitation. And uh, if you get a chance to vote, don't forget old Henry Clay. Thank you.